From space, our planet's oceans appear peaceful and surround our planet in a blue embrace. From shore, one witnesses the true character of the ocean, a ceaseless churning of water and waves rarely silent, often unpredictable, and full of mystery. Florida is bordered by more ocean than any other state except Alaska. The Gulf Stream's warm current flows like an oceanic river and wraps around the Sunshine State on its way from the Gulf of Mexico northwards. This oceanic river can flow at a speed of several knots, scouring the reefs and wrecks of Florida's coasts. The ebb and flow of the Gulf Stream, combined with Florida's ever-changing weather, bathes Florida's coast in warm waters teeming with plant and animal life. It's now summer in South Florida. The winter lemon shark aggregation has come and gone. Spring sea turtle season has come and gone. And it's time for a new Leviathan to come into focus in Florida waters. Every year between August and September, at the height of hurricane season, another aggregation of megafauna takes place. Goliath groupers arrive in numbers to aggregate in and around the shipwrecks and reefs of Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County has the largest and most accessible aggregations for this species. At first, ones and twos appear, adding to the resident population. Then more arrive, and they keep arriving. Where they come from and where they go after spawning is not well understood, but scientists have recorded goliaths as far north as southern Georgia. One thing is clear, though. South Florida is a special place for these fish. This late summer aggregation along the Treasure Coast and the Palm Beaches is the largest concentration of goliaths known, and it is the only place in the world for divers to interact with these giants in such large numbers. Once hunted to near extinction, a large portion of the goliath population aggregates here. Perhaps they return in part due to the ongoing artificial reef program, which might offer good shelter. Or perhaps there's something ingrained deep within these fish and they're just returning to original territories like salmon and sea turtles do. South Florida is also a destination for scuba divers, many who travel from far away just to see and interact with these gentle giants. They brave sweltering air temperatures to enjoy Florida's warm coastal water and to spend time with the largest reef fish in the Caribbean. Goliath grouper are one of those fish that are really impressive to see underwater. So being able to View them underwater is something that a lot of divers will pay a lot of money for. And they've actually done economic impact studies to show the value of a single fish alive versus dead. And they found that because of the economic impact of the dive industry in Florida, the value of Goliath grouper is pretty high. This fish is perfect for an ecotourist industry. Perfect. Because you can see low numbers of them, let's say less than a dozen, any time of the year, you can see much more than a dozen, up to a hundred, during spawning time. They 
are one of those fish that you're guaranteed to see at most artificial reefs. Um, they are, again, very impressive and approachable underwater. They're charismatic megafauna. There's not very many places in the world that you can interact with a fish of this size. grouper in abundance now. They're recovering, they're still recovering. They're hitting bumps in the road by red tide and cold uh, events and uh, damaged um, uh, juvenile habitat. But they're abundant enough to still attract, you know, this diving industry resource. They're beneficial to our tourism, they're beneficial to the dive community. We need to do what we can to protect them. Uh, we need to have the population grow. Fortunately, nearly 30 years of continuous protection for goliaths has made a positive impact on the species. Scientists aren't sure about the goliaths' historic numbers, but current population trends seem to show them slowly increasing. However, this hasn't always been the case. At the time, it seemed like the right thing to do to spear these fish who were considered underutilized species and utilize them. Of course, a lot of things seemed like the right thing to do at the time, like shark fishing and things like that. It turns out that it wasn't, but we learned from it. Well, with the Goliath grouper, they just, it was, you know, it's a slow growing, long lived fish. It can't take any pressure. I saw them decline. I saw it off Palm Beach. Actually, they were gone before I even got there in the early 70s. Heard the stories of the great big herds, but I never saw that. And then in the Gulf, that was where we came in and speared them. But I saw the decline. It started pretty rapidly, especially after a few more people got, got out there spearing them. They, they just, resource couldn't take the pressure. Rex had had in excess of 100 fish on them, went down to maybe one or two. So that's a pretty serious decline. Historical accounts of Goliath numbers from as early as the 1950s are sketchy. But most accounts agree that the numbers were still high. Old-time fishers such as Kenny Rosinas and Frank Hammett from West Palm Beach talk about taking five to ten fish a day, every day. A good year was 100,000 pounds of fish. Four or five other boats were taking similar numbers of fish, with an annual total close to a half million pounds of fish per year killed. But the story actually begins nearly 50 years before Hammett and Rosinas were on the scene, when Goliaths were being targeted by anglers in the early 1900s. Jean Johnson's tackle shop was thriving and catching goliaths all the way up to Daytona Beach, while others were catching them down along the coast to the Florida Keys. Because of their size and their slow nature, goliath grouper were easy targets. After the last trip I made out to the Stony where I saw the one fish, I came home and it just really started eating away at me. And I got up at 3 in the morning and started a letter to the Gulf Council. It took me several days to write it and I sent it, actually it was Terry Leary. He was her biologist statistician at the time. And I went back and forth with him and they gave it to the council. And then from there it went to the FWC and then the South Atlantic and pretty much everyone agreed they needed to be closed. There was no real opposition. There wasn't anything to lose, they were gone. Florida's historic range for the Goliaths is unclear 
but it likely extended into northern Florida and above on the east coast and throughout the Gulf on the west coast. As fishing pressure increased and the Goliath's population decreased, so did their range, until all that was left was a fragmented population barely able to sustain its numbers. Goliath aggregations are extremely vulnerable to human predation, and after predation, many of these aggregations never reform, nor do the populations recover. I just never thought they would come back like they did, but they're attracted to metal and high profile areas, and they went right to these wrecks. And less than 10 years after protection, we saw aggregations reforming again. Shocked a lot of the resident divers there. It was a pleasant shock. It's, it shows that if you do protect these things, they'll come back. And a lot of times, it's less time than you think. Now, Don advocates for fishery conservation. With his local knowledge and understanding of fisheries and marine ecosystems, he works with scientists and helps to disseminate information so that fishery managers and conservationists can make informed decisions that will guarantee that the Goliath population remains strong and everyone can enjoy these exceptional animals. You can't get too fixated on the species itself. You gotta look at the environment. And if the environment is not healthy to support it, it's not gonna support other species that live in that same environment and they all lose. And so it comes down to water quality and what's going on right now in the state with all this algae blooms in the Indian River Lagoon and the red tide events that are happening on the West Coast are all gonna have a long, uh, profound effect on that environment that this fish lives in as well as everything else we go out there and enjoy, sea turtles, uh, snapper, grunts, angelfish, everything that we like to look at. You know, whether you're a diver or a recreational fisherman, even a commercial, it's gonna have a huge impact on all of us. Fortunately for Goliath Grouper, there's an abundance of research ongoing that is providing scientists with a more complete understanding of their life cycle and the role they play in the dynamics of the ecosystem in which they live. Dr. Angela Collins has been conducting a long-term presence and abundance study of artificial and hard bottom habitat in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. So we've been doing it for over 10 years, um, and a lot of these sites we've been repeat visiting. Uh, I did a lot of this work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for the state of Florida, and also for the University of South Florida. Today, with the help of her friend and colleague, Christy Erickson, Angela's planning a dive to gather additional data in an effort to understand more about the Goliaths. So what I think what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna video, uh -huh. and then you're gonna count. Okay. And This only has 2,000 pounds. And basically what we were doing is going down and counting the number of Goliath groupers at these certain specific habitats, both artificial reefs and natural ledges, and then also getting an idea of the size distribution. So using underwater videography, we were able to basically use lasers to get size estimates of all of the fish that were present at a specific site. One of the results of Angela's research was the confirmation that Goliaths were more likely to be present and more abundant on artificial reefs with good structure, like shipwrecks. Florida has a thriving artificial reef program, one of the most active in the country. Over the last 70 years, more than 3,300 artificial reefs have been placed or sunk along coastal Florida. These structures provide good habitat for fish, often where there was none. Many of these high relief structures provide the preferred habitat for the Goliaths. One of the prevailing scientific hypotheses is that these shipwrecks are helping in the recovery by allowing larger Goliath aggregations to form. Moat Marine Lab's Dr. Jim Lacazio is conducting a study using passive acoustic monitoring to record Goliath sounds at certain aggregation sites, 
as one of the parameters to qualify that location as a spawning site. These animals concentrate at predictable locations and uh, there's a term which um, has a technical meaning called hyperstability, which is where catch per unit effort doesn't track the abundance of animals um, well enough to be used as a predictor for how stable the population is. Uh, in this case, you can kind of think of it as applying to seeing a large, dense group of animals on a wreck and it giving the impression falsely that the population uh, is very high. The levels are high, uh, but when it's not the spawning season where you see 60 or 80 fish, you'll see two or three. And so uh, there's that, that misleading impression that is given. Uh, so who can say how many uh, fish there are? Mark and recapture studies are underway, but there's no um, conclusions yet from those. So more of that work would help us understand that. Passive acoustic monitoring allows Jim to record high-resolution, long-term sound production data without a researcher needing to be present to operate the recording equipment. This allows Jim to monitor multiple sites at the same time in order to determine where reproductive behavior may be taking place. In the future, these data may also be beneficial in helping to approximate the number of individual grouper at a given site, leading to a better estimation of their population numbers. Get the, get the tape straight. Science is often collaborative in nature. During a field session where Jim and his students are catching and fitting goliaths with new acoustic tags and scanning for older tags, they collect tissue samples that can be analyzed for contaminants and also eggs that can be used as another parameter to qualify an aggregation site as a spawning site. See all the eggs? Mm -hmm. All right, we want a nice big uh, sample of those eggs. We can get them. These tissue samples will be sent to Dr. Chris Malinowski, who is conducting research through Florida State University and the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory for analyzing and testing for heavy metal contaminants. What I've been trying to understand is what the levels of mercury are in Goliath grouper, and what I found is, is extraordinarily high levels of mercury in all tissues. And that is not surprising because Florida itself has some of the highest rates of mercury in the atmosphere in the United States and a lot of that comes from those municipal waste incineration. There's also direct runoff from human um, urban areas. So urban sources of river drainage, things that come from land use, is also a big contributor of mercury into the environment. The other side of this is looking at what humans may be confronted with if this fishery was, was reopened again. Methyl mercury is the component of that, the more damaging component, the more toxic component, is what humans would be exposed to if they were to consume the fillet or the, the muscle tissue of this fish. Goliath grouper population is heavily contaminated with mercury. It is among the heaviest contamination of any commercial species in the United States, all of which are recommended by FDA, EPA, NRDC, and the Florida Department of Health not to be eaten. Mercury is a naturally occurring element in the Earth's environment, in part due to global volcanic events. But humans have sped up the process of methylation through anthropogenic behavior such as coal combustion, mining, and waste incineration. Methylmercury is the end product of airborne contaminants and anthropogenic pollutants that through rainfall or wet deposition onto the soil flow off the land and into the sea. Once in the ocean's benthic environment, anaerobic bacteria convert the inorganic mercury to methylmercury. In this form, it bioaccumulates in marine organisms and climbs the trophic ladder into the fish that humans like to eat like swordfish, shark, and grouper. And so it's really that transformation process from the atmosphere, once it's released, to mercury in the water, in the marine environment, and that process of methylation that really increases our exposure to mercury as humans.
Environmental issues other than mercury still persist and have negative implications for this fish's recovery. Chemicals and pesticides leaching off the land into aquatic habitats make water quality in coastal Florida poor. Human pollution from septic systems and algal blooms from lake discharges also affect water quality negatively. Florida mangroves are Goliath grouper nurseries, and mangrove habitat destruction from more recent severe storms and human development has affected juvenile recruitment. Without more Goliath babies, adult populations will ultimately fail. What we have now is a miracle that we have as many as we do, uh, and that occurred because of our uh, the moratorium that was imposed 1990, but I, I also know the fish is extremely vulnerable to overfishing. The history shows that. Say you see a hundred grunts. You don't even think about it, but if you see a hundred goliath that have come from as far away as Georgia to aggregate here to spawn, you think it's a lot of fish, but it's still just 100 animals. So every one you take is a significant amount of the reproductive population. Whether or not we're, we're yet the recovery uh, to pre-recovery levels isn't, isn't believed to be the case. And so we're in a recovery phase. Um, there's no data that support um, the, a practical reason for reopening the fishery right now. And that's really what we have to base our decisions on. In Florida, there is a movement to reopen the harvest of the Goliath grouper now that the local population is recovering. But for now, Goliath grouper remain a protected species and a modern-day success story in a troubled ecosystem. It represents a great example of what can happen when the right decisions are made to conserve a species. And we're uh, well into the recovery, no question about it, but are we fully recovered? What, what kind of a... A uh, milestone do we need to hit? These are all questions that um, really need more information behind them before we can um, make this kind of a bold decision after 27 years of effective conservation.